Welcome to ALD Stories, a series of conversations where we share the untold stories of atomic layer deposition and the people behind the technology. This podcast is brought to you by Benek, the home of ALD. I'm Leah Luo, your host for the show. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, in fact, our very first uh, guest on this podcast series, outside myself and Patrick. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Rika Purunen. She is the Professor of Catalysis Science and Technology from the Department of Chemical and Metallurgical Engineering at the Aalto University here in Finland. Hi there. Rika. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. It's very interesting to be here. Thank you for being our first guest on the show. Um, so perhaps, um, uh, Rika, a quick introduction to those listeners who may not yet be very familiar with, uh, with you and what you have done. Could you just briefly introduce who you are? Yes. So you already mentioned I'm a um, professor at Aalto University. I'm a tenure track professor. I'm here for three and a half years now, and um, I've been working uh, with ALD quite a long time, already more than 20 years actually. So my my uh, path in ALD started from microchemistry, where I made my master's thesis, then uh, um, Helsinki University of Technology, where I made my doctoral thesis. I've been postdocing at, at IMEC in uh, Belgium, and uh, then for more than 10 years, I was at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. And from there, I came then to Aalto University. And uh, ALD has been like, like the red thread kind of going through my research career. So I am uh, working now with catalysis as the applications. And that's where I started at Aalto as well. But then I've, I've worked with other, other things in the meantime. And, and uh, so if the listeners are from the ALD field, they might know me um, or quite likely know me from some of the review articles I've written. So there are three reviews in um, applied physics reviews. There's one on the surface chemistry of ALD. There's one on crystallinity and the latest one on um, conformality of ALD. And uh, and there's also some original research I've done, which might be familiar to some. So I've worked on uh, several models um, to describe the ALD in various ways. Um, I've been interested in the reaction mechanisms. Um, while I was at VTT, we also worked on uh, mechanical property analysis. And then uh, the latest thing has been the um, test trap for analyzing the conformality of ALD films and also um, trying to extract kinetic information of growth. So that's that's something really interesting, new new things. Actually, this week a paper came out or was published on that topic. Okay, what was the second one again? Uh, there was a bit of a glitch. Can you repeat the second part? So mechanical property analysis. Properties, yes. Yes, yes. So we have been uh, investigating, for example, simply the stress uh, on films. So if you grow films on substrates, you will see that the substrate, it will bow like upwards or downwards. And that's caused by the, the intrinsic uh, stre stress that the film has. And uh, those we have been characterizing. There was once uh, an assumption that ALD films are stress-free, but they are not. Aha. So, yeah, that's that's something where progress has been taken in the last years. Lots lots of progress. That's that sounds like a very interesting topic. Uh, we might get back uh, dive into deeper into that in in a bit. But for this minute, um, maybe we just take a quick um, trace back and because you, uh, you mentioned that ALD has always been a red thread. Uh, up until now, you know, through your university career, academic uh, studies, to VTT, which is a research institute here in Finland, and now um, at Aalto. So what got you originally interested in ALD? Um, well, there was chance involved. I was a uh, student at Helsinki University of Technology, uh, studying industrial chemistry as, as my major, and then it was time to do my master's thesis, and I 
went to Outi Krause, professor, to, uh, to discuss possibilities, and she offered uh, me a position. She told that there's now no just a, a person needed a microchemistry related to ALD. And uh, that got me interested, and yeah, that's the, that started my path, and I've never left. So it really was her in that position at the time. So it could have been something else as well? Yes. So that really has uh, has dictated my career in a way. Yes. So from there, I got uh, in contact with Suvi Haukka, who you very much know as a core person in the ALD field. I hope you know her. <laughs> uh, so she was one of my thesis advisors. And I also met Tuomo Suntola at micro microchemistry very, very quickly. And it was an inspiring world. And I, I didn't want to um, change the topic fully. I mean, I've changed then the applications. I've worked uh, related to also the high K development at the uh, IMEC and MEMS development at VTT. So ALE has stayed, but the applications have been different. Naturally, I mean, the ALD community in Finland is very strong. I mean, relatively speaking for a small country like, yes. uh, like this. Um, now you touched on this earlier and just to get back into it. So what are your main areas of interest in ALD or, or have been, uh, you mentioned you've done a, a few different reviews. Are they really the, the, the areas that you like to focus on? Yeah, so those uh, interests have shifted with time at the moment. I do want to start uh, research related to heterogeneous catalysis. Um, so Finland used to be the world leader in this in the 90s when Neste was um, had a had a program actually on this and that's what my my thesis was also related to and uh, Neste uh, so this big big company in Finland uh, working Energy. on oil but but the renewable uh, business at the moment so they stopped um, around 2000 and uh, after that uh, this field has been slowly growing anyway and and uh, I would say that USA and China are maybe now the leading so I kind of would like to bring Finland back on the map in particle ALD and then um, another thing that I'm really interested in at the moment are these conformality analysis things because uh, while I was at VTT I developed this uh, new test concept for conformality of ALD films lateral high aspect ratio test structures and with these, you can really uh, see things you couldn't see before and do things you couldn't do before. So that's, uh, and that can be also linked to uh, powders. So that's, that's something where I want to move forward to and see it expanding in the world. Conformality. So that's the, um, the sort of your most recent focus, right? Yes, yes. And conformality uh, means, of course, that you are able to code complex 3D objects with a uniform film by ALD. And uh, so this is something that is often cited for ALD. But then when you are going to the real extremes, you have to do process tuning to be able to do that. And that's, that's where these uh, test structures kind of hit. So what happened to me while I was at VTT, we were working with thin film processes and then um, and devices, and then we got this device wafer with a request that uh, can you coat this with ALD, and there might be then aspect ratios of 300 to 1 involved, and I didn't know if our process goes there, and that's kind of what triggered the, the need to develop test structures, and we, we cannot test on process wafers, we need to have separate test structures for that, process wafers are far too expensive. Right. And VTT, I guess you guys uh, were more of a research uh, project, right? So you didn't actually have, did you have industrial uh, samples to work on or it was more of an experimental type of research? All right, at uh, VTT, I was working in the Micronova clean room. So we took the first Picosan reactor, I mentioned your competitor, sorry, but this is a general thing. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is yeah. uh, open discussion. Yes, at VTT, um, this reactor was taken in use in 2005, and that's when I started working there. And uh, well, these uh, processes are being used in, in all kinds of process flows. So um, um, at VTT, there are, are uh, intelligent engineers designing all kinds of uh, devices, but then there are also companies 
doing uh, their research there. So there are actually big Finnish companies and also uh, startups that have come from, for example, from US to do their their development there. So ALD is being used here and there. So it's not just just research. Uh, Rika, I was listening to you. It seems like uh, you're doing some really, really interesting stuff. Obviously, the conformality stuff is, is fascinating. I think you mentioned a little bit about powders as well. What do you have in mind there, too, so so you can tell the audience what, what you think we should be doing there? Uh, powder uh, ALD is a growing field. Um, my interest at the moment is related to catalysis. So with, with ALD, we can make uh, at least very well controlled model catalysts. And that can be very interesting for scientific research. I know that companies might not be so interested in this because I'm, I'm not convinced myself at the moment that ALD would have big prospects for commercial catalysts. But then there are these energy applications, for example, where where powder ALD is very uh, important. And there are two startups in the world at the moment that are concentrating on powders uh, fully. So that was not the case in the 90s when, when this Finnish uh, company stopped that research. So, so there's clear indications of growth. Um, my first uh, objective is to demonstrate again that we are able to make uniform coatings also throughout these uh, high surface area powders that are used for catalysts. So here we are talking of aspect ratios of more than a thousand to one. So conformality wise, these are very demanding. And I do think that there might be quite some, some um, research published where the materials might actually not be uniform. They might not be conformal. They might might not have been coated throughout in the same way because this hasn't been analyzed. It's it's not a typical thing to do in the papers these days to to show that it's it's assumed but it's not demonstrated. So that's that's for me the first thing I want to show is that we actually are are able to make uniform materials and after that we go to the applications. All right. Thank you. Um, that's a very interesting uh, topic there. Um, now, let's, we have uh, mentioned this article about the history of ALD, uh, and you mentioned it, Rika, that you wrote this six years ago already. So let's just quickly kind of talk about why you decided to, to you know, write this article and who was your uh, target audience when you did so? Yeah, it was nice that you are asking this. So I didn't write it actually as a scientific article to start with. I wrote it as a story to the exhibition that we had in Finland in 2014. It was called 40 years of ALD in Finland, photos and stories. So I was uh, collecting this exhibition to be shown together at, uh, with the Baltic ALD conference that was organized by the um, ALD Center of Excellence, where I was part of. Um, yeah, that's so was so the exhibition was... part of that conference? Was this so photo the photo conference... exhibition part of that? Uh... It well, it was organized for that. Yeah, it was a separate exhibition, but we wanted to make it ready and show it at that conference. So we had these uh, six posters. Yeah, we, we had actually a separate exhibition there, but it was also then shown at the same time at Micronova and it also traveled to Kyoto. So this was one story there, one of the stories and uh, there were other stories. And, uh, but this was the, so so the article you mentioned, it's it's the story of Suntolas, Tuomo Suntolas atomic layer epitaxy, no history of that. So I took the challenge of writing that up as I was sitting together with Suntola a few times to, to uh, do that and get all the details right. And, uh, and after the exhibition and after the conference, or actually just, just even before the conference started, I decided that I, it's so valuable. What I had written down is so valuable that it should actually be published. So then I wrote the introduction and maybe conclusions also to that and submitted it to the, to the journal. 
but um, about the audience. Well, um, really it was meant for the conference participants. And this is the Baltic ALD conference. So uh, it means generally Finland and the neighboring countries. And um, at this conference, I knew that uh, people from St. Petersburg are also coming. So, you know, uh, ALD has been invented twice by Suntula in Finland and also by our Russian neighbors in the 60s. And I had visited St. Petersburg in November. There was a Benek App Lab opening there where I was invited. And I, I actually gave two uh, um, lectures, short, short presentations there. And I, I went there to find out about the early days of ALD. And I met lots of uh, people there. And I invited those people also to come to this Baltic ALD. And they did. So I think that was the first time that, that these uh, Russian scientists came to the Baltic ALD. And when I was in St. Petersburg, I uh, realized that these people had not much clue of how ALD had been invented in Finland. And uh, I realized that this is something I have to clarify. And uh, so actually, it's partly these Russian ALD scientists were my target audience. But, but anybody who is interested in the history, also myself, because uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, I have had to check some of the details back from that paper. I wrote everything down so that you can check the, the, the references and the places. There are addresses included and all, all details are double checked. So this is a very that interesting answer your question. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it brings a, a new color to, to this because when we were reading it, obviously we didn't have, um, we weren't privy to, to this background knowledge. And, uh, you know, in, if anyone knows something about the history of ALD, there's actually almost uh, parallel inventions in both in Russia and in Finland, right? I mean, in very different ways. Um, but uh, now it's, it makes sense that, you know, if you're going to St. Petersburg and presenting to these academics, um, maybe it's just a way to, sh to explain this, the, how the sequence of the events, how it unfolded in, in, in the Finnish side of the story. Mm. Would it be fair to say that? That sounded correct. Okay. And then what happened was once we had this, uh, this story of the Finnish invention ready, what I wanted and what also Suntula was requesting that now the Russians, they also should write up their story. And you know, they did. There's a Where follow up. Where can we find that? Uh, it's in the same journal about one year later. I can send you a copy. Okay, we will, um, for our listeners, we'll link uh, these articles in the in our description so that you can go and do your own uh, reading afterwards. Thank you, that sounds great. Actually, this is fascinating part of it because reading your story, there's uh, also a mention uh, you clearly said about uh, the Russian part of it. Um, I, I didn't know that there was their own sort of historical background on that. I think I'd, I'd love to see that. And when it comes to history, of course, um, I, I consider myself part of that too, on the historical sense, because uh, to be honest with you, before I, I came to Finland, I, I knew very little about the history of that. And when I started reading about it, somebody always finds that picture of Sven Lindfors sitting in front of that reactor, right? Yeah. Um, when I first came to, uh, to work at Benek, actually, my first office mate was Arto Pakkala. Uh -huh. And I know that you mentioned in this, perhaps you can uh, expand on that. There's, there's a point in there when you see the, the photograph of Sven Lindfors. What we don't see is Arto working in there as well, especially on when he says that seen as a own moment. That's Why don't it. you take us you know, back in time and tell us what, uh, what was the, uh, the, uh, the background to, to that comment and perhaps how that influenced the development of ALD reactors going forward in time. And okay. for our English uh, audience, just quick uh, explanation here, Sina Seon in Finnish is like, there it is. So that he yes. actually had this aha moment, right? Yes, okay, so 
I am about as old as the invention of ALD. So obviously I haven't been there observing anything. I have written down what I've heard and uh, the source of this essay is Tuomo Suntola, the Finnish inventor of ALD. And uh, so, so basically now I, I just have to tell you what, what my, my impression is, but you should really ask Arto and Tuomo. Sven Lindfors, you cannot anymore ask because, uh, well, he's late Sven Lindfors. But so this, this uh, photo is related to um, the flow reactor, uh, glass tube reactor, which they had been developing. And the development of ALD started from um, elemental reactants. So zinc and sulfur, which were evaporated in a rotating reactor, um, high vacuum, as I remember. And uh, they had uh, turned into using um, carrier gas based reactor. And I understand that they were using this zinc sulfur process there also. So this, this one based on the elemental reactants. Um, there was the idea quite early to use chloride reactants, so zinc chloride. And um, uh, for this breakthrough, which it was this moment, seen as on, that's it. What they had done is that, um, so they had tried zinc chloride with, with many things, so, so just with sulfur, I think, and with hydrogen flown over sulfur, and it didn't really work out. And then what is not written in the essay, but what I've heard, I think from Sven Lindfors and probably Tuomo Suntola both, or one of them, um, is that Sven Lindfors had actually borrowed a bottle of hydrogen sulfide from KCL. So that's a, a uh, institute here in Otaniemi that was uh, concentrating on, on pulp and paper research. So they just went and borrowed a bottle and uh, that, that wouldn't really be possible these days anymore, I think. <laughs> but they they uh, plugged it into the reactor and, and tried zinc uh, chloride and hydrogen sulfide. And then they saw that the result was much better than what they had had earlier. So I understand that they had observed how the film terminates in the glass tube. So you know that when you have a laminar flow, you can observe the uh, termination or actually the, the front of the, um, the film and uh, different processes have different sharpness for this front. And they observed that from the sink uh, chloride plus uh, hydrogen sulfide process, that termination front was really sharp and the, the film looked really uniform in color. So that's it. <laughs> that, that, that was the, the moment when Arto, like, I, I don't think it was a, a big uh, heureka moment for him. I think he just realized that, hey, this is, now we have it and now we continue to other challenges. So it was a turning point. After that, they didn't go back to these elemental reactants. But uh, but yeah. It's fascinating stuff, the things that you don't see actually in history. And uh, it's worthwhile, actually, just fascinating from the point of view and uh, historical purposes. Um, do you think that this fundamentally changed the way that the, react the ALD reactors were made? In other words, you know, did, did we end up with a different concept that we had at the very beginning. So they have tried different types of reactors, and I know it only from the patents and publications. Um, uh, they were working with this uh, inert gas reactor. You know, I, I don't know, actually, um, if that changed the way they were designing the reactors. They, they were on the way of trying many different things, and they also ended up doing this various spatial ALD concepts and batch reactor concepts. Um, I think that having these, uh, uh, these compound reactant type processes was probably necessary for things to go further, yes. So it yeah. kind of enabled it, but I don't know if it right. changed it. But uh, maybe I can propose that you will invite Arto Pakkala to, to this uh, series, because I would really like to hear his opinion, his viewpoints on these. So he's one of the, the grand people who have done his whole career on ALD. Mm. Now, when I was reading your, your, your very, very complete history, uh, I was trying to, you know, to sort of uh, visualize myself the different 
uh, steps and history of ALD. And I think you did a very good job saying, you know, the way that you put it, it was some, something at the very beginning, ALD or ALE, if you will, gets discovered. Uh, then we go into the EL period of time. Then we go into the microchemistry time. And then we go into the, should we say, uh, the 1990s, the post microchemistry um, time. Um, could you comment maybe in each one of those areas, what in your mind was the most important thing that, that happened in each one of those uh, areas for okay. historical purposes, of course? Yes. So, so you were pretty much describing the, the division that I presented in the, in the essay. And we need to remember that that essay is a story of Suntula. It's not a story or history of ALD. A, that, that would be a broader topic. So that essay is really concentrating on Suntola's story in ALD, because there are, I think, much more than 10,000 people working with ALD, and they all have their own stories. But that uh, story of Suntola is central anyway. So yeah, of course, um, it, it started from 1974 with the invention of ALD uh, and, the, and the first uh, experiments and then the first patent. It was all all in 1974, the first patent was filed on November 29th. And uh, so that's, that's when it all started. Um, then I think that uh, the demonstration of, of the target, actually what Suntola had, he, he didn't have inventing, as ALD, inventing of ALD as a target, but, but he wanted to make flat panel displays by the electroluminescence uh, technology. So the first demonstration of, of that principle um, publicly in a conference, that, that was a, a breakthrough. So that was in 1980. Um, that's described in, in the essay um, how, yeah, they, they Suntola came, came from a, uh, was an unknown person coming from an unknown country and showing something that was clearly ahead of the um, competitors at that time. So he hadn't realized that himself and and uh, that's well, well, they they got lots of uh, interest, but they still were not ready with the with the product. Um, the product uh, became ready a few years later, um, 1985, I believe that the production was started. That's also described. But then for Suntola, he's he's an inventor and a technology developer, and not not so much a sales guy, I guess. So then um, he. Uh, no longer was leading the like the sales type uh, product development at uh, Lohja it was then um, and uh, eventually I think he was invited to uh, start a new company in uh, in a joint venture between Neste and Lohja where they would uh, use atomic layer epitaxy then for uh, photovoltaic devices for so they had been turning electricity into light with these electroluminescent displays and then they wanted to reverse the thing turn light into electricity that was really the the starting point of micro microchemistry and uh, so first it was for their own development but quite soon it turned to also making those research reactors first for themselves and then then for others um, 1990 is also mentioned in the paper, not uh, because it would be really important for the development of ALD, but rather because that's um, when the first international ALD conference or atomic layer epitaxy conference was organized in ESPO. And uh, the interesting thing is that there, the, the physical face-to-face -face contact between these two branches of ALD happened. So Victor Drost, Dr. Victor Drost uh, came there from St. Petersburg to visit that conference. So, so after that, we cannot say that there would not have been knowledge of these, these branches. Also Jan Arik from Estonia managed to come there. And you have to think it was year 1990 look at the geopolitical situation of the world yeah. at that stage. So it makes you think deeper than, than is in the paper, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I decided that uh, that would be a nice time to describe how ALD had been spreading in the world. So it had, there, there was quite a strong research already in Japan at that time. Uh, also in USA, I think in several places even. And um, 
Mm, I'm not sure if Estonia is mentioned in the paper, maybe not because Suntola wasn't aware of that, but in Estonia they started daily research, I think latest 18, uh, 1983. Um, but what is mentioned is this uh, Russian branch. So Suntola got invited by Viktor Rost uh, at that conference and he traveled to St. Petersburg with a train arriving at this uh, Finski Vaksal, I think, the fin Finland station. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, he was uh, very nicely treated there and uh, got to know Alaskovsky and also concluded himself that this is the same technology. It's, it's described there in the paper and maybe a nice anecdote, anecdote now that I told you that I went to St. Petersburg in 2013 for this Benek App Lab. It was the same Dr. Viktor Trost who came to meet me at the same station. I felt like now the history, <laughs> we say history and CV and Havina, Havina in Finnish. So like the, uh, the wings of history are, are around me when I was, uh, when I was uh, arriving there. I was also very nicely welcomed. Yeah, fascinating stuff. And I mean, I'm glad that you, um, you know, you pointed out the uh, sort of uh, the connection because ALD, as you pointed out, has been really invented twice. And I also was, you know, fascinating reading your paper that you're very, very careful in using the right terminology, ML, you know, as the Russians were using, ALE as uh, here in Finland, we, we tend to, uh, um, you know, to associate with MLE as the Japanese were, were using it. And then finally, we all decided that the right thing should be ALD. Uh, why do you think it's important to to use the right terminology? How does this help understanding the history of ALD? Okay, okay, right terminology. Well, the, the parents give the name to the child, right? So these are the names that, that these people have given to their technology and it's, is it a right term or, well, wrong term not, but, but there might not be one like correct Term. So I, I kind of, uh, for me, it's difficult to, to talk of what is right and what is wrong, but it's, it makes things much more easy if we are consistent with terminology. And that I was certainly doing in that essay and that I would hope that we would do also in the scientific field. Um, these terms that you mentioned are by far not the only terms that have been used for ALD, not in Finland. So also in Finland, this atomic layer epitaxy was not followed by all others. If you will look in the publications, I think that the first scientific publication from atomic layer epitaxy or ALE in uh, Finland, it actually didn't use this term. I think it was atomic layer evaporation from, from, uh -huh. uh, from Tampere. And also in Russia, the same thing. They also don't always call it molecular layering. There are also different variations there. So it, it makes it more difficult to trace back li literature if you are using different terms. Also, there was this uh, atomic layer chemical vapor deposition. That was the term that was being used when I started with ALE. So I think uh -huh. that my first publication uses that. And, um, but now atomic ALCVD. layer- ALCVD. ALCVD, yes, didn't, hadn't you heard wow. about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ALD is nice and brief and uh, nowadays people use it. So I think it's good to stick with that, even though each one of these three words can be criticized for not, not being really correct or very well descriptive. But that's, that's another thing altogether. You bet. Getting back to you, Rika, I think one thing I've always wanted to ask you um, is you're an active member of the ALD community at large and you've been very active to organize um, events get togethers sharing and exchanging of, uh, of research uh, so we are very grateful that you're doing this what motivates you to organize and grow this community okay uh, yeah I am an active member of the old ALD community um, it's it's a community of great people and great science so that's that's why I <clears throat> I really appreciate it um, yes and I, I participate indeed 
um, now I, I don't fully maybe recognize what you were mentioning here that I've been uh, organizing these things. Of course, I've been participating in the organization board of this uh, international ALD conference already um, a, a long time with a little bit of break and then back again. But the main organizers have been elsewhere. Um, but what I have done last year in Finland and what we will do again is this uh, November networking event, ALD at yes. Aalto University. So, so that is uh, something where I would like to uh, bring the people together uh, who are working with ALD here at Aalto University and in, gen in Finland in general, because uh, there are many people working with different applications, like applying ALD for different things. And I think it would be useful if these people would know each other. I think it can can like accelerate science and bring new ideas and and uh, so I think it's worth doing that. And I've noticed that it doesn't happen by itself. So when I was a new scientist, I noticed that uh, when I go to conference conferences abroad, that's where I learn to know the things. And it's a little bit disappointing that you have to travel to USA or travel to Korea to, <laughs> right meet, to meet your Finnish yeah. colleague, right? So, so that's uh, one of the reasons why I would like to create these events where the people can meet those around them and uh, discuss and, and network and uh, yeah. Hmm. So and this then, is more then meet, of a Finnish mm. event. Well, last year that was the first time that this was organized. And it was local, it was also in-person event. Now we are uh, living in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it was a question, do we organize this again? And if yes, how? And we are going for this hybrid type of event where we have a small group of people present only from, from the School of Chemical Engineering because others aren't maybe even not able to enter. And then we'll do it um, by remote means and we'll do it in two days. And the first day is gonna be fully open internationally. So we will welcome anybody to listen to our lectures. So we have, uh, I'm gonna give a tutorial on ALD in the morning. You, you don't find this program anywhere yet, but I'll, I'll tell anyway what it is. So tutorial on ALD in the morning. And then we have Jonas Sundqvist, uh, Bold Engineering, uh, talking about the ALD markets and, and applications. Then we have Tuomo Suntola, uh, talking about whether nature can be understood. And then we have Angel Yanguaskil from Argon National Laboratory talking about um, modeling ALD. I, I think that there's the conformality tint included, but it comes goes from fundamentals up to um, artificial intelligence. And those talks are going to be open for everybody. And then the next day we do a, a more uh, smaller local networking. That's a very strong lineup. Uh, we're for mm -hmm. sure, definitely. I'm I'm going to attend this this event. Uh, thank you for right. the invitation. Um, now, as as you mentioned, um, some you know the networking event obviously is is local, um, and uh, some of this will be open online to the international community. So a lot of our most of our listeners are going to be global. I mean, we get uh, emails um, and questions sometimes from the university. Uh, Alberta and in Korea. So for a lot of the international uh, members of the community, uh, one question is what is the vibe of the Nordic ALD community, uh, particularly in Finland? What is the vibe like? Do you guys, you know, actually meet together often, exchange, or uh, it's actually just like everyone else, we meet only once a year? What's the vibe in Nordic ALD? Yeah, there isn't any formal organization, at least what I would be aware of. Of course, you you can realize that I'm I'm a, a little bit younger generation than the leading professors have been. So there might be at the older professor level some some community that I'm I'm kind of not part of. But uh, um, uh, well. It's basically Twitter, LinkedIn, these things that are open for everybody. So I wouldn't say, I, I can't recognize that there would be 
like a special Nordic community, even though that would actually sound quite nice. We have had these Baltic ALB meetings, which have then mm. expanded to far beyond Baltic. Uh, Norway has also been Baltic at some point, and Luxembourg was also Baltic. So it's right. a very, very yeah. uh, diffuse uh, word uh, or definition for Baltic. Yeah. And now I think we're coming up to time, but so the last couple of questions I want to ask about you uh, in particular, what are your career goals in ALD? You've been in this, this line of research for quite some years now. So what would you, what's your end goal um, at the end of this for yourself? My end goal, ah, oh, you are asking uh, <laughs> big difficult things. I, I uh, I don't have an end goal, actually. I, I don't have. So one of my, my goals got really fulfilled when Suntola got this Millennium Technology Prize. That I have to say. So that's something I was working for for a long time. Also partly this history project, the essay and the virtual project on the history of ALD. They have partly um, been uh, not only to find out about the early days of ALD and document, but also also support Suntola for this prize. That, that, has been the case. And I also wrote that uh, a very strong nomination letter and I was happy to see that that uh, he got the prize. So in that way, something has been fulfilled. Um, my career goal as professor is to get tenured. So I need to start that process very soon. Um, in ALD, I've been working with ALD because it keeps on being interesting and surprising. And I've also tried to like, um, um, target some of the misunderstandings that have been spreading around and even causing personal tension. So one has been this, uh, like overlooking the, the other invention that has been one of the things. Now, now I think that's kind of uh, getting better. Um, then there's a misconception that ALD should somehow ideally result in one full monolayer per cycle and that the, the, there should be an ALD window where you have a constant growth of one full monolayer per cycle of the material that you make. I, I think that these are just misconceptions, that there's no, no reason to think so. It, those are misconceptions both by, by, made by both um, branches of inventors. They both thought of this first, but then when you start looking into into uh, really the fundamentals. I don't think there's a basis for that. And I think I share this opinion with many, but still all these schemes of you, what you see about ALD, they show that monolayer per cycle. So I'm, I'm fighting against this spreading of that misconception. So that's one career goal. And maybe then also related to this uh, conformality of ALD. So it's something that it's almost always stated in, in papers, ALD is conformal. And then it's assumed that the process that is being reported is also conformal, but I, I think it has to be demonstrated. And um, so I hope that this, uh, this test concept is spreading and that also we will learn how to extract kinetic information. So the, the apparent or the, the lump sticking coefficient from those saturation profiles that, that can now be measured. That's, that's uh, and, and there can maybe grow a community around that topic as well. So this is for the next, next years to come. And, but you know, maybe I will not be working through my life with ALD like, like Arto Pakkala did. Maybe, maybe it stops being so interesting at some point and then I will shift the focus to something else. I don't know, I didn't do that yet. Well, hopefully not. I mean, you certainly sound like you have a lot of interesting things, uh, a lot of value to contribute there. And you also mentioned many different topics, but uh, it seems like what drives you here is uh, to challenge uh, assumptions or misconceptions people sure. hold dear to about ALD, right? People think certain things and they kind of just assume that. Uh, whether it's about the conformality or uh, what the model layer uh, sort of properties, do you really kind of think, well, look, technology has evolved, we can really do more than that. So, or there maybe there are other untruths here that needs to be uncovered. So would it be mm. fair to say that that's really what something that you're passionate about? Yeah, fundamentals, fundamentals of ALD, yes, for sure. And, you know, 
now that you realize that the growth per cycle is less than a monolayer, but it is a certain value, why is it that value? This is a question that mm. hasn't is not so often being asked, and, and asked. that's very yeah. intriguing. So here's a question we ask every guest on this show, and um, so we're, we're going to ask you now. Um, if you didn't work on ALD research, and from today's interview, uh, we learned that it was a chance in, encounter uh, that sort of got you into this career. So if you didn't work on ALD, what would you be doing as a career? <clears throat> I would be working with research and development somehow, most likely. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, it was it was a pure coincidence that I came here. You know, maybe I would have found it anyway, but I found it then through this uh, master's thesis. Um, if I wouldn't work with research directly, I could be in some technical sales, I think. That could be a possibility. Um, yeah, or, or teaching or being a professor, you know, these are also real career options. But if, if those doors hadn't opened for me, I think that being a professional photographer could also have happened. Well, on that note, uh, Rika, we thank you very much for your time today. And it's really exciting to hear your stories and these stories that you have to share um, about ALD and the history of that article that you wrote. Um, you know, as our, the title of our podcast uh, says, ALD Stories, really, we wanted to have an open discussion um, that is a, sort of like, feels like a fireside uh, chat. So. This is exactly what we wanted uh, for our listeners today. I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation and uh, we'll talk to you in the next one. All right. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. This, this was a pleasure and, and an honor. I, I didn't know that I'm your first guest, so that's especially great then. So thank you very much. You're listening to ALD Stories with Benek, the home of ALD. To stay tuned for new episodes, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Talk to you in the next one.